Good morning and welcome once again to our NWBA Sunday Sermon. However you're joining with us, whatever purpose you're using this for, I pray that you may know God's peace and God's presence and God's blessing as you come together. And it may in some way help you feel connected to the wider community of which we are all a part in Christ. Let's begin with a hymn that is a celebration of God's love, a classic one, Love Divine. All loves excelling. Welcome to this latest NWBA update, where we want to tell you a little bit about the work of Renew Wellbeing, which is being led by one of our NWBA team, Fiona. But before we do that, let's remind you again that we've got an opportunity to be together on the 8th of November, when we gather at Carey Baptist Church with resound worship to think about our climate, our environment, and God's call upon us as his people to respond as stewards of creation. This is going to be the first chance to be together as an NWBA community in person, so we hope that we will see you there. 
Hi, I'm Fiona and I am the Renew Wellbeing Coordinator for the NWBA. This weekend I'm on a church weekend in Llandudno with my home church, Long Baptist. And I would like to introduce you to Roz, who's the lead host at the Renew Wellbeing space in Long Baptist. So Roz, how's it been going? Well, we started off at the beginning of the year um, Zooming and then as soon as we could we opened up for the church um, sitting outside and it was beautiful. Every Monday morning we sat outside for an hour and the sun shone. It was it absolutely did. brilliant and um, we had a prayer, five minutes prayer within that time. That's fantastic. So are you opening out to the wider community now? Yes, yeah, we, um, as soon as we felt we could that was um, in April, no September, Sorry. We, we then decided to, to have a launch and we've opened up to the community, we've had, several, we've had a couple of people continue to be regulars from the community, so it's, Brilliant. it's working. Brilliant. And we're enjoying the press space that we have, which is really lovely. Hi everyone, I'm here with Johnny. You may have seen Johnny a couple of weeks ago telling us about Impact Weekend, but Johnny's also the minister at K Street in Rossendale. So Johnny, what's going on in Rossendale at the moment? Yeah, well, uh, like a lot of our places, we're just getting going again with um, some in-person activities and some setting up kind of some, some of the stuff we did before, but some, a lot of new things uh, as well, particularly around children's and youth work. Um, but we're also exploring what it means, and we have been exploring in recent months, about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so we're, we're setting going on a, on a discipling program uh, that we've been working on called Plan to Grow. Um, and that's really responding to, uh, to, to, to two things of Jesus. Firstly, come and follow me. That's all about the plan. And um, plan is all about uh, prayer, life, accountability, and nurture. They're the things that Jesus calls us into. Um, and grow is all about um, his commission to go, to go and make disciples. So that's about actually going. What does it mean to go? How do we do that? To uh, reproduce, reproduce disciples, so go and make disciples. To obey and, and learn what it means to obey Jesus' commands. And finally, that to look at that promise that we don't go alone, but actually we go with uh, Jesus. He's always with us. That's, that's the promise at the end of the Great Commission. So plan to grow that's all about our discipleship at the minute and just trying to explore about what does that mean for us as a church as we explore being uh, disciples who make up the church and are called to serve um, God in the world uh, both as as a group but but as individuals in our in our weeks in our workplaces in our schools and in our uh, lives all together so yeah that's what's going on K Street at the minute. Fantastic sounds good so that is the acronym of the week plan to grow uh, so please pray for the disciples that are forming and being formed in Rossendale. As we now centre our attention on God's word together, let's pray. Loving and eternal God, in the midst of a world where words are so easy to compile and share, where we can cut and paste and like and post and forward at the touch of a button, help us to pause in this moment and recognise the power of words and the timeless and profound reality of your word to us. We give you thanks for those who have worked hard to preserve its manuscripts, to place their every chapter and verse within our grasp, and to enable us to understand and appreciate its truth. But we pray that we will not simply be those who receive your word, but also reflect and embody its message as our lives and attitudes are shaped by all that it contains. Where we falter and struggle, may your word encourage and sustain us. Where we rush to go our own way, may it restrain and challenge us. Where we are confused and uncertain, may your word help us make sense of the realities before us. 
and when we feel broken and helpless, may it bring the healing and strength that we need. So speak to us now, we pray, as we centre ourselves again on this most precious of gifts to us. Amen. We read from Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab, and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. If you regularly engage with our Sunday sermons, you'll know that for the last few weeks we've been looking together at Mark chapter 10, following the Revised Common Lectionary, which connects us with Christians right across the world who will be exploring the same parts of Scripture. Well, this week we're continuing to follow the lectionary, but as you have no doubt gathered from our reading today, we're also crossing the tracks, so to speak, and dipping into the Old Testament reading for the day, which of course is Ruth chapter 1. Now this is a story that very much belongs to the history books of God's people, and it's recorded as having taken place some centuries before Jesus came along. And so the people that we meet in the Gospels, those who featured in and recorded the accounts of the life and the ministry of Jesus, would have been well aware of the story of Ruth and the place that she held in their nation's history. But as we look at that story together today, I want us to notice some of the key messages that emerge from it and the way that they actually echo some of those that we've drawn from Mark chapter 10 in our previous sermons. And I hope that I can convince you of that in the next few minutes. And as we do explore that, I want to invite you to just not lose sight of that broader principle, so to speak, because what it tells us is that there is a consistency 
and a reliability in God's message. And in a world where so much at the moment is shifting and uncertain, that in itself can be a source of strength and encouragement for us. Circumstances might change, time will follow its inevitable course, but there is a constancy to God's message and God's being that transcends all of that. And just as the people of the Gospels found themselves removed by some centuries from the life and the circumstances of Ruth and Naomi, so we too are separated by some centuries from the earthly life and ministry of Jesus. But as we recognise how the message of Jesus echoes the message of God that by then had already resounded through history, so we can recognise that for all that time has passed again, for all that our world is different, the message of the gospel has an unrelenting relevance in human history, in every generation of human history. And there is perhaps a hint of a connection between these two parts of scripture in the way that Jesus was addressed by Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10 when he called him the son of David, which was not just a reflection of Jesus' physical ancestry, but a recognition of his identity as the Messiah from the house of David that the prophets of the Old Testament had consistently spoken about. And although the story of Ruth and Naomi at one level is a very intimate and personal story, it also has considerable historic significance. Ruth, we discover if we do our research, becomes the great-grandmother of that self-same King David who gives rise to the title of Jesus. But of course, if you're going to accept the point that God's message is unchanging, then we need to find a deeper connection than just the kind of biblical version of who do you think you are. So let me try and offer you that. When we look together at Mark chapter 10, which of course you can still connect with through our YouTube channel, we began to see the key or one of the key threads that ran through it was about what we are willing to let go of and what we are seeking to grasp. Let go of your wealth and status, said Jesus to a rich young man, if you want to take hold of the inheritance of my kingdom. And of course, that was a step that the man was not willing to take. Let go of your aspirations of status, says Jesus to his disciples, and learn to become the servant of all. And of course, we see this very attitude displayed at the end of the chapter by a blind man who casts his begging cloak aside, lets go of the life that he had, and willingly accepts the invitation to follow Jesus. And at the heart of this story, from Ruth chapter 1, we find two women. Two women who ironically are not invited to let go of what they have, but they're invited to keep hold of it. Orpha and Ruth. Go back to your old life, says Naomi, as they stand together on the border pass between Moab and Judah. Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Grasp the security that this world has to offer, says Naomi, with absolute selfless intent. But can you see how it kind of contrasts with the invitation of the gospel? Now, of course, we do have to recognise that this story is set in a very different culture to our own. So that instruction to go back to your mother's house and find another husband might grate with us today. But in the society that Ruth and Orpha lived, that was the only security that there was for a young widow. And as we discover when Naomi and Ruth eventually do arrive back in Bethlehem, the same was true in the nation of Israel at the time as it was in the land of Moab and pretty much in many other places too. So we begin to see something of the broader context of this invitation. Go back and put your trust in the systems and the structures of the world in which you live. Seek your financial security. And Naomi, as clearly a woman who is godly and devout, even equates this as the means of God's provision. May God look kindly on you, she says, and provide what you need. May God bless you in those endeavours. And Orpha accepts that invitation. She embraces her mother-in-law and heads off back to Moab. But Ruth won't have it. 
Just as Mark chapter 10 offers us a story of contrasts, so there is a contrast in the way that these two destitute young women respond to their circumstances. Ruth is adamant that she wants to pursue another way. She's going to stick with Naomi. She's going to place her trust in God, not to provide through the material channels of the culture and the people that she comes from, but she will covenant herself to God and the people of God, come what may. Like that blind beggar that we met at the end of Mark chapter 10, she is willing to set aside and to leave behind the trappings of the life that she was born into and to put her trust in God. And the significance and the formality of that commitment is emphasised by the way in which the text is written here, because Ruth makes a covenant, a covenant that we are clearly intended to take notice of. Just look for a minute at the way in which Ruth chapter 1 is structured. In the space of five verses, we've heard about a famine, a family's journey to Moab, how they settle there, how the two sons marry and all three men die. <laughs> so a whole load of significant life events that probably took place over a couple or more years are covered in six sentences. <laughs> two weddings and three funerals, not to mention a relocation. And yet, when Ruth is standing with Naomi on a mountain pass on the borders of Moab and Judah, every word of their exchange is recorded including this detailed statement from Ruth, where you go, I will go, where you stay, I will stay, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. It's an oath, it's a covenant, and it's deliberately recorded word for word and written to take central place in the narrative to make that point because God's people are a covenant people they are a people to whom God has said I will be your God and you will be my people and even though Ruth may have been born in a very different place even though many would say she belonged in the land of Moab she somehow manages to grasp this possibility of God's covenant and in committing herself to Naomi, she commits herself to Naomi's people and Naomi's God. She enters into God's covenant. Now, as a bit of an aside, there's a massive message for us here about mission. Naomi had nothing to offer but a life of struggle and destitution. Okay, we maybe know it doesn't work out that way, but that's how Naomi saw it. And she doesn't try to wrap it up or make it attractive. In fact, she goes out of her way to discourage Ruth. But Ruth becomes caught up in the purposes of God. And it's God's covenant that draws her into God's kingdom, not the sales pitches of God's people. And the power of Ruth's actions becomes even more obvious when we begin to compare them to the actions of Elimelech that are summarised in those opening sentences to which we made reference earlier. And at the heart of this covenant between God and the people of God is the land. A land that was God's gift to them. A land in which they belonged and to which their identity was attached. But the moment that the land fails to provide, when the harvests fail, Elimelech gives up on God's covenant and begins to seek his fortune elsewhere. And there is a painful and powerful irony in this story that in seeking to preserve his life, he loses it. In seeking to perpetuate his family name, he loses that. And after all of that has been lost, the land, the land in which he belonged is still there. The harvest returns, but Elimelech and his sons are not there to benefit from it. And if we choose to retell Elimelech's story in Christian vocabulary, we might describe his identity as one of God's people in terms of discipleship. And when the cost of discipleship became too great, he gave up on it and moved to another town. When the, his journey of discipleship failed to deliver on his defined expectations, he chose another path. Instead of trusting himself and his family to God's covenant, he decided to trust in his own devices. And he paid a heavy price for that. And here again, 
we see another resonance with Mark chapter 10, which perhaps explains why those who compile the lectionary have invited us to look at the story of Ruth alongside the middle part of Mark's gospel. Because in the early part of Mark chapter 10, we meet a man who wanted to find his way into God's kingdom through his own endeavours and his own devices. And at the heart of chapter 10, with its contrasting examples of those who had the faith to choose the way of discipleship and those who were not willing to pay its price, we find an image of covenant. Those who heard it might not have realised it at the time, but when Jesus spoke of going to Jerusalem to be handed over to the rulers and the chief priests to suffer and to die and to rise again, he was speaking of covenant. And as the story unfolds, we do eventually find Jesus arriving in Jerusalem. And sure enough, just as he says, as he does, the conflict and the pressure from the authorities begins to intensify. And as that becomes increasingly obvious that they're going to make their move, they seek the trial and execution. Jesus gathers his disciples in an upper room to celebrate the Passover. And on the eve of his execution, he takes the cup of the Passover and he declares that this will be the new covenant in his blood and as later New Testament writers underline he is referring us here to his death on a cross so when Jesus makes mention of the cross in the narratives of the gospel he is speaking of covenant we too are a covenant people we are those who are invited to walk in God's ways, knowing that at times that might not be an easy pathway. We're invited to take up the cross, as unglamorous as the life of destitution that seemed inevitable if Ruth was to stick with Naomi. But in so doing, we are invited into God's covenant. And so we're invited to take our example and our encouragement from Ruth and to trust in God come what may. Ruth chose a way that offered her no guarantees of prosperity or reward. Okay, many of us do know how the story unfolds, and of course I have somewhat given the game away by explaining that she was a distant ancestor of Jesus. But in that moment, as they stood at the border pass, she didn't weigh up her options and work out that the land of Judah would offer her a better deal. She knew full well that she probably had a better chance of making a fist of it in Moab. But I belong with you, she says to Naomi. I belong with your people. I belong with your God. And I make my choice on the basis, not of which is the better deal in the world's terms, but on where I sense I belong in God's greater purposes. She chooses the way of God's covenant. I choose to leave behind the life I had, she says and to find my place in the purposes of God. And so, yeah, the circumstances might be very different. The language and the culture might be different. But I would suggest that embedded in Ruth chapter 1 and Mark chapter 10, we find the self-same invitation, the same dynamics of faith, the same explanation of discipleship, the same invitation to let go of whatever hinders and to choose to walk that path of discipleship. But of course, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there is a bigger story here, a bigger story than two women simply pitching their fortunes with one another. Because Ruth not only finds her place among God's people, but she becomes nothing less than the great grandmother of a king, and no ordinary run of the mill king, but David, the great figure from Israel's history who sets the standard for every other king. But as we once more shift our attention to the Gospels, we recognise that this moment is even more significant than that. Because centuries later, another destitute couple made their way to Bethlehem, perhaps even passing through some of the same roads and streets along which Ruth and Naomi made their epic journey all those years earlier. And they made that journey because they were of the house and lineage of David. And in the midst of all of their confusion and uncertainty, a child was born. A child that we recognise today as the fulfilment of God's covenant promise that through this nation, salvation would come to the whole world. 
a child who grew up to become the man Jesus. And as Ruth considered the pleading of Naomi to give up on her and to head back to Moab, nothing less than our salvation hung in the balance. Ruth could never have imagined just how significant this decision of hers would prove to be. She chose potential destitution for herself, and in so doing, she chose salvation for the world. Now, okay, I get it. If God was going to become flesh and make his dwelling among us, I am sure, I am more than sure, that he could have managed to do that without Ruth and Naomi and David and Mary and Joseph. But God chose to work through them. God chose to do more than they could hope or imagine through that simple covenant commitment to walk in his ways. And if we are looking for yet another example to encourage us and remind us that whatever we might feel we are called to abandon in order to take up our own journey of discipleship, it is nothing compared to what God might accomplish through us. Then surely this mountain pass commitment is one example of that. Now, I'm not saying, therefore, that if we choose to walk God's ways, we will have the same significance and reputation that eventually came Ruth's way. But that doesn't matter. We do not choose the way of discipleship to achieve significance in this world's eyes. We choose the way of discipleship because the promise and the hope of eternity eclipses any price that we might feel we have to pay. God's kingdom and the immeasurable riches of eternity are far greater worth than anything we might be tempted to cling on to or reluctant to release. And Ruth's story is just an earthly illustration of that. And so if we're finding the road tough, if we're struggling to hang on, then stories like those of Ruth and others can encourage us that it really is worth staying put on that journey. So maybe our prayer this week is that God will help and encourage us to stand fast in our own covenant commitment and to hold on to the hope that is ours through the cross. Loving God, help us to know what it means to be a covenant people. Amen.
Spirit.